Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal chaps, and we do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, me, an engineer and devil's advocate, and Benjamin Campos, a designer and believer. We choose a topic of interest, something we think we need to know more about. We spend a very small amount of time researching it, and then we have a discussion, and we publish the notes. We do this because we believe that it will foster a greater understanding of the world and uh, hopefully inspire conversation and thought from our listeners. Uh, the topic that we're attempting to talk about this time around is feminism. Also, our notes for the show are available when we publish the podcast on our website, eclecticist.co.uk, so please pop along and uh, have a look at the notes and uh, read as you listen along. Since time immemorial and throughout the world, women continue to struggle against sexism, sexual violence, misrepresentation, economic inequality, and social exclusion. The term feminism appears to many as a collective term for the fight against these affronts. Should all gender designations in the West become feminists, or has it become a victim propaganda gone too far? Um, I think we should start with a quick definition of feminism. In the OxfordDictionaries.com, feminism is defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of the equality of the sexes. Full stop. That's all. So that's the definition. I, I should warn listeners that this is a very uh, Western perspective on feminism. So when we're speaking about feminism, we're speaking about feminism as we digest it in the West. So we're sort of mostly excluding the rest of the world here. Yes. Actually, we should also um, just remind listeners just of the international nature of, uh, of our show. I am, of course, in uh, Hollywood, California, and Jeff is in London, Ontario. That's right. London, the in the sceptered isle, known as Britain, also known as the United Kingdom. Yes. So we should also preface this show by saying um, that I'm assuming we both support um, women having the same rights as men, just, you know, in, in, in a basic sense. You know, I, I think that sounds reasonable. And I think that definition that you just read, um, not quite vague, but as um, non-specific as it is, uh, is, sounds reasonable to me. Well, it doesn't sound reasonable to me, okay. because I think what it is describing is a completely different word than feminism, as far as I understand feminism, which is not very far at all. This seems to be a definition for equality, gender equality. So I think gender equality in terms of similar, if not the same, um, opportunities available to both genders is not what I have sort of started to understand about feminism at all. So we are pro-gender equality. That is to say, it would horrify us if it came to our attention that women were not being credited for exactly the same work or productivity uh, as men. That would horrify us, and I can imagine it would probably horrify everyone we know. So gender equality is something we certainly support. But feminism, I think, is something different, and I think it needs a different definition, but I simply haven't been able to find one. Right, okay. Well, it kind of means a lot these days, and I'm certainly hearing that um, that word bandied around. Um, and there's there's an ugly side of this, um, which is this with us or against us kind of chestnut that there is with feminism, um, where if you're questioning anything, anything bogus from um, a, a feminist voice, um, you are now fair game for being trashed, essentially. Uh, and I think just browsing in the general chatter online, that's putting a, a lot of people's backs up and that's sort of creating this us and them kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, th this was, I should say that this show topic was your idea. So I'm assuming that you have something, um, you have some experience that uh, led you to want to discuss this. 
my experience is that I don't understand what it is, right. but I read about it all the time. So I read the Guardian opinion section daily and a few other newspapers in this country like The Independent and The Absurder. And uh, every single day they seem to have an article that either mentions or proposes feminist ideologies. And every time I read these articles, I, I come away thinking I know less about feminism than I thought I did. And I, I certainly never have a full grasp on exactly what it is or what it means. I have a lot of opinions on it, but I'm I, honestly, in doing the research for this show, I, I still feel as though I don't really know what exactly it is. I understand um, the desire and indeed the struggle for gender equality. And I understand the struggle against sexism. But what feminist feminism is and what the feminist agenda is, I, si I simply don't understand what it is. For me, it's either fighting against sexism or fighting for equality. Is there anything else there? Well, from my understanding, um, and again, this is a very kind of um, not particularly thorough understanding, it's taking issue with... Uh, the, there being differences between male and female. I think feminists tend to think that you're just born just blank, um, and then it's society. And be being a female is a choice. Not far off from that. It certainly <laughs> seems that, that, that there, there's something in that. Um, and uh, it's there's maybe this whole history of oppression might have something to do with it. And I think there's a general tone of somehow if you're uh, displaying um, or expressing masculinity, um, that should be shunned. Uh, that's the impression I get. Um, and I think uh, there is a lot of counter evidence to this notion that um, men and women are the same. And this is what I was saying earlier, by highlighting or maybe questioning, you know, what, what actual evidence are you talking about that we're, we're the same? Then it's like, you're shouted down for being so um, patriarchal. Um, I agree with you in that there, the evidence is important, and we'll get to that. But also, I think that, I mean, it's polarizing, or at least it seems to want to be polarizing. And I think there are, I mean, obviously we are all aware that there are significant physiological differences between men and women. I mean, we aren't all a blank slate, and it's not a choice. There are genders. Well, yeah, ha no, hang on. I mean, you're just saying that, but that is seen, what you just said, is controversial. Um, by saying that, well, there are differences. There are feminists, particularly the, the radical feminist clade, who would think that that's, that's nonsense. That there aren't actually physiological differences. <laughs> 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 besides, yeah, but besides the obvious differences, um, there are there aren't differences, and it's just the society that is shaped. Yes, men and, men women. and women are from Mars. I'm sure that that must yes. be a book title out there somewhere. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, even just saying that sounds crazy. I mean, to me, it's you know, men and women complement each other. Really, you know, they're, they're the yin and yang. Both of them, you know, both. Yeah, well, it's exactly that. It's, you know, men are good for these things, women are good for these things, and together, well, hey. Yeah, know, but that's a sort of absolutist yeah, the... uh, divisory agenda is the problem. You're, you're classifying yes. and pigeonholing, and in fact, equal opportunities for all, regardless. Well, hang on a minute. What did you just mean by saying that's the problem? My way of thinking just then is a problem that you... No, I can imagine that could manifest itself as a problem in a philosophical discussion between the genders because you're saying men are good for these things and women are good for those things hang on a minute why can't women do those things and why can't men do those things why why must there be this sort of uh, absolutist classification system that's fine um but i mean maybe we should talk about the actual differences and i don't i don't just mean differences in terms of um physical strength uh and and um, pretty eyes. Uh, but mean, you must start like... from the physiological differences. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is women are incapacitated by harboring the next generation 
and, and you know, caring for them and looking after them. Whereas men spray and pray, but aren't necessarily physically incapacitated. So this is a fundamental biological fact that is inescapable so far. Maybe one day it's escapable, but at the moment, the fact of the matter is, a woman gets pregnant, she is physically incapacitated in terms of serious hard work or hunting or... Whoa, 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 now that whatever. was controversial. Serious hard work. Men, 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 don't, men don't get pregnant. Yeah, because they can't. They're, if they're pregnant, they're, they seriously cannot do serious hard work. They cannot do it. No, I, I understand that, but the... by saying that seems to suggest that being pregnant isn't serious hard work. I think what you mean to say is chopping down trees and stuff like that. Yes, that, that is what I meant to say. For sure, for sure. Uh, so, so there are major differences. Um, you know, men never... 100% at a genetic level, for sure, know that they have offspring. They just don't know, right? So they want to continue to impregnate, continue to up the probabilities, but they never really know. Whereas women absolutely, definitely, hormonally, chemically, and genetically know that they are pregnant, right? That they have offspring, because it's actually inside their bodies. Never really know. That's a weird one. I'm not sure I follow you there. Well, men, men never really know. Of course you don't know. I mean, as a, biologically, as a biological organism, you do not know that you have offspring. You cannot know that. that. That's why men are fertile up until their 80s, because it's spray and pray. See, that doesn't really make much sense to me. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that might apply if you're talking about Neanderthals or something. But in this day and age, and you, you were specifically talking about in the West, um, I think men generally do know. Is it Neanderthals or Neanderthals? What did I just say? I don't know, but I'm just Neander wondering. I think it's a Neanderthal. Yeah, I think it's Neanderthal. Um, what, no, what I mean is, is that your body doesn't know whether or not it has passed its genes to the next generation. It cannot know that. Whereas a, women, a woman's body can know that. Because the woman's body is the one who actually generates the next generation i mean if humans were just dumb terminals i think that would be an interesting and correct argument but because men have brains and can see evidence that uh, they are involved in this the enterprise of children um i i don't really think that holds water i, I don't i don't follow you okay so what i'm saying is your brain may well be a hundred percent convinced that you have propagated the next generation, but your genes, as it were, to take the almost artistic um, uh, imaginings of, of Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene, your genes are unaware that they have achieved their goal, and therefore they'll keep firing regardless. Whereas women, hormonally, chemically, are, 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 it is confirmed that they have the next generation in the offing. And that, I think, is seriously important in terms of comportment and general behavior. And that's such a divider between the genders that it creates impenetrable walls between the genders. And I think that um, sort of uh, vibrates out and 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 fans out to create a, a serious divide between the genders, which has major ramifications. That's all I'm saying. All I'm trying to say is that there absolutely are fundamental physiological differences, and those differences have a major effect on the behavior and the outcomes of social interaction between the genders. Okay, well, I'm assuming that this is an area where... Um... Someone speaking from the perspective of radical feminism would probably take issue with and say it's only rad femme, rad femme. It's only um, it's, you know male based, male weighted society that uh, sees it that way. And um, <laughs> I mean, and the thing that works. What I always thought about that when, I mean, this is this is maybe even not particularly pertinent to the topic, but when a let's say a clade 
of individuals take issue with a ruling clade of individuals and they say look the only reason why x y and z is because you are in that position we are oppressed uh you're evil i think well how did that positioning come about what 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 reason is there that you are in that position for instance if women are and we're jumping ahead here but if women believe themselves to be oppressed in any way by men and they take issue with this the question arrives into my mind how were you bested effectively why are men why do they have the upper hand why are they in the superior position in a lot of ways how did that happen <laughs> there are reasons for this what are those reasons let's investigate why we have the situation that we have now you know always look to history you know what what, what happened in the past you know and and while we're on the history point I, I think it's important to point out that uh there appear from my small amount of research to be two in the west two major movements of feminism one the first movement was mostly a, a movement of suffrage that is women um being franchised into an electoral system being able to vote being able to have a voice in a democratic system or any kind of governmental system uh so there's a major fight um throughout the last couple of centuries uh to get the vote basically you know we want to vote in this country it was 1922 uh, and they called themselves the suffragettes because they are women who wanted suffrage uh and they achieved it and that was seen as a major feminist movement and victory but then there was a a second wave of feminism and this started in the 1960s and uh, one of the major figures of this second wave um who i see often in the uk is germaine greer she's uh, i think she's an australian academic um getting quite old now but um she's still around and she's still on the circuit and she does a lot of talks uh, heavily academic um and this second wave is different from the first wave the first wave was to achieve equality whereas this second wave seems to be and i think this is the definition that i'm arriving at with feminism in general it's a kind of sisterhood it is a, a gang or a group uh, of women who get together and you know they're, they're sort of generally fighting against men in particular for a lot of reasons and this is how feminism seems to be describing itself to me from everything that i read it's like a a clique or um you know a gang and i just think if it's a gang does gangsterism follow you know is 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 there a bigger agenda to this but uh historically speaking i just wanted to point out that it seems as though there have been two relatively recent movements of feminism and i think they're a little bit different and the one that we are constantly um reading about today is this second movement that started in the 60s that's all i think there are two main reasons for why um women had the role that they had and were seen as second class until until they weren't um and that's male made religions i think that's probably the biggest one uh i think all the the major all the main religions uh, typically are weighted towards the man um, and I would argue it's because they're written by men. Um, and going back even further than that, I think this to so the very dawn of civilization, dawn of man, I should say, um, is just strength. Men were strong. They called the shots because they were, <laughs> that's where all the strength was. And I think in both of these, religion and that um, primitive way of thinking about sheer strength, we, we've flown that perch. So that's where the second wave uh, comes from. It's like, okay, well now we've, we've advanced and now let's take it to the next level. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I think it, it definitely is down to physical strength. And because physical strength has always been incredibly important in life and for survival, uh, it's incredibly important. And it still is, just as we still have light bulbs that glow because they're heating up metal with little filaments and we're still boiling water for energy 
I think we still rely on physical human strength in order to get things done. So I, I don't think we've flown the perch entirely. I think we, we, we vi- revisit that perch quite often because every time I look at a building site, I, I don't see any women. It's all men because its strength is still a major factor. One of these days it won't be, and perhaps things will change. But at the moment, it's still a factor. I think it's, it's not 100% the reason why you don't see women on a building site. I agree. Yeah, okay. Um, and I agree with you that at some point I think that'll change. Um, and so going back from what you said about Jermaine Greer in the 60s and stuff, I mean, at a glance, it, it all seems so reasonable to me. It's like, well, yeah, it seems pretty unfair, um, a wage gap. And the fact that women didn't have the vote until relatively recently, you know, less than a hundred years, yeah. and all this kind of thing. But I think where both you and I, what both you and I take issue with, is uh, is where it goes from equality to some kind of what's the what would the word be dominance or white male guilt. White male, yeah. I mean, again, white male guilt is a term that I hear all the time. Um, and also we should say, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about you, but we are both from a generation where, um, women are equal, really, or at least that's how we see it. And if so, if, if someone is being, um, misogynistic, then I will certainly feel quite com- uncomfortable about that. Uh, you know, and ob- objectification, which happens, you know, makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable and all of this kind of thing. So I'm willing to say that, man, there's just something going on here, which I just, <laughs> I just don't understand. I don't quite understand objectification. That's another term I've heard often. W- what exactly does that mean? Oh, the literal sense, seeing women as objects. Are they not? They are. Are, 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 are we all not objects? Well, they are and they're not. I mean, a phone is an object. Um, a woman is a human being. Yeah, different types of objects. But I think object is problematic, to use that word. It's like they're more than objects. They are human beings. Well, obviously, yeah, it's it, it's a pejorative, but it means to me that you don't, you don't consider the whole package, I suppose. But I mean, if somebody portrays themselves in a particular way, and, and, you know, as another individual, you will look at that person and think and, and, and judge them by the way they are portraying themselves. You don't necessarily have the whole story, but that's true of any human interaction. You never know anybody fully until you fully know them. But on, on a cursory analysis, you judge somebody by the way in which they are portraying themselves or the actions that they have perpetrated. So, <laughs> and, and then you can, I suppose, you can extrapolate your general experiences or extrapolate your prejudices. So an example would be you see a pretty lady walking down the street and you think, you know, she's a sex object. But if you break that down, what, what is it you're actually saying? You're saying, okay, look, she's physically attractive and she's walking down the street. What, what else is there to that apart from those extrapolations I was talking about? I don't think I understand. I don't think finding a woman attractive is um, objectification. To objectify her. Yeah, I think object, ob- objectification in the context we're talking about means just women as eye candy. It's like employing a woman... For her to drape herself in front of a sports car or or something like that um that is what the problem is and that is demeaning to women or 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 so we're told and so and yes. so i think so so hiring a woman because she's attractive in order to put that woman next to a product that you're trying to sell that's objectification uh, yes, I, I think that could be classed as objectification, which... And, and that's a bad thing. Um, I think you could make an argument that it's a bad thing. Um, I mean, it, for me, it's one of those things that's just simply a fact of life. <laughs> you know, we, we to, to generalize, we, we enjoy looking at attractive people. Um, 
and uh, there is some kind of legacy of attractive women in marketing. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I could see that as being a problem. Um, I'm not sure what I think about that, really, to be honest. But I think, I think generally speaking, men like to see attractive women. Yes. I mean, if you were to take, and I mean, this is completely relative, if you were to take attractive women and unattractive women to any particular male, the male would, by the very definition, prefer to look at the attractive woman. Obviously. This is not rocket science. I mean... <laughs> this is not rocket science. Yeah, but, what's the point but as far as that? a relative argument, the point I'm making is that there's a spectrum and objectification seems to only consider those at one end of the spectrum so you're 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 objectified if you're attractive to males you tend not to be objectified if you're not attractive to males that's all i'm saying and another couple of um another couple of important definitions here i believe sexism again oxforddictionaries.com sexism is defined as a prejudice stereotyping or discrimination typically against women on the basis of sex and gender equality this is the view that men and women should receive equal treatment and should not be discriminated against based on gender so there's a lot of interpretation in those terms i think you know i mean you can discriminate on gender obviously because of the physiological differences right you're going you're going to discriminate at some point but in terms of opportunities that is to say if you are an, an, an employer or a potential employer and you have a female candidate and a male candidate and they are equally able to achieve the value that you've set as an employer it, you're discriminating you know, all else being equal, you're discriminating on gender lines. So does that not swing both ways? If you were to hire the woman, are you not discriminating against the man? Or if you hire the man, are you not discriminating against the woman? This is an equal balance. So gender equality and gender inequality swings in both ways, unless it's a numbers game. Is it a numbers game? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I really follow you there. Um, although it does bring me on to something else, which is something I, I, I wrote in the... Oh, what's funny? <laughs> you're not answering the question. Oh, I, 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 I didn't really questions. understand what you're talking about. I, I don't know how long we gender, want to spend gen, I'm, I'm, sim I'm simply saying, gender equality, it swings both ways. Right. It must. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess it does swing both ways. Okay, go on, try again. What do you mean exactly? I guess in the back of the, my mind, I'm thinking of affirmative action. Mm. I guess if you're just ticking boxes and you want an equal number of men and an equal number of women, then that's fine mm. as long as everybody's equally capable. Yes. But if everybody is not equally capable and you're still ticking those boxes, then that's a problem. Yeah, I agree. And I, I yeah. think that is unavoidable, that situation. Um, I think you, you need to... Um be wary of that if you're an employer and i think employers generally must have to bear that in mind and maybe there are lots of occasions when they hire someone who might not necessarily be um the most skillful the most you know best at this job or whatever but they needed to hire a woman <laughs> and i'm sure that works yes. right across the board but i can't imagine how you'd correct for that that just seems like an inevitability yeah, it is an inevitability. I mean, uh, again, perhaps I'm jumping ahead here, but um, I was reading um, a couple of weeks ago about Apple, um, Apple Corp, Apple Group, Apple Computers. I don't know what they're called. Maybe just Apple. Apple. Uh, this is the largest company in the world who produce um, affordable luxury. And uh, they were trying to address the gender imbalance in their company. And they're promising the public and presumably the shareholders that they intend to hire more female members of staff. 
And how, how are they going to achieve that without discrimination and perhaps unfair discrimination? I mean, you know, they, they, they recognize a fact that they have more men working for their company in certainly in the higher positions than women. And they, they feel the need to address this imbalance. So how are they going to address that? Are they going to take two out of every three successful candidates as women? Or are they going to just hope that more females apply for the jobs or, or phrase the, the, the job advertisements in ways in which women might I, it seems like they want to tick more boxes to me. I, I just think, again, affirmative action in the back of my mind. How is that a good thing? Well, I mean, it does sound exactly like a situation where they will be discriminating against men. Um, and plus also, they're obviously feeling it's under uh, pressure from various places, um, t which highlight this imbalance as they see it as how there are just um such low numbers of women in tech in, in the tech industry uh and I'm, I'm hearing this from all over the place you know and th that's actually a huge concern from a lot of these feminist groups and uh, you know just doing a search online about this kind of thing there's lots of guys saying or lots of males em employers talking about how look these are the applicants um, and talking about the differences between differences in their brains, how men are typically more suited to this kind of te technical work because that's the kind of thing men prefer doing, which is just so controversial in the eyes of so many. It's true, um, but my you know I I my office is really close to a very large building site. I think it's one of the largest building projects in Europe at the moment, which is the Transport for London project to build a tunnel all the way, all the way across London um, for trains. And, uh, you know, every day I look at a huge and very complicated building site, and I've never once seen a woman at all. So I think to myself, well, what would best explain this fact? Is it because Transport for London is hideously sexist and they simply refuse to hire all of the able and willing and qualified female engineers? Or is there another reason? Well, you know what I think? It's just like I feel uncomfortable around blokey blokes. You know, big stinking blokes who want to talk about football and scratch their arse and leer at women and all this kind of thing. I find that uncomfortable. And so... Um, the Australians beat the British at cricket um, yesterday. Is that a newsflash? I, I, I guess so. That's a, that's a blokey newsflash. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, there we are. Um, so I empathize with a woman who doesn't want to be in that environment. It's like, well, that sucks. Uh, and I think... I mean, I don't know what would have to happen to address that and um so this is what i said earlier about the physical strength of men is only part of the reason why it's uh largely men in those environments yeah it's only part but i think it's a significant part I, i'm sure it is you know a, ma a manual labor job is a manual labor job and you do need to lift heavy weights frequently men are better at doing that they they just are stronger, uh, you know. I mean, obviously, the, the you know the strongest person in the world may be a woman. You know, this is just a trend we're talking about here. Men generally are stronger, but you know, but, but there are such um, basic differences that the casual observer will notice, and the fact that that casual observer might be somehow given a hard time for this just basic observation is. A really crappy situation and that is just women generally tend to be more interested in looking good whereas a guy typically isn't and so i think a woman might have a problem with working on a building site is because they don't want to get scratches all over their hands they don't want to break their nails they don't want to all these kinds of things that simply doesn't bother dudes t to generalize i think that's just a fact 
I, I think it's interesting. Again, in terms of sort of evolutionary history, um, women, or, or rather females, females of any species, are the ones who are left holding the baby. They're the ones who invest a heck of a lot more time and energy in the outcomes of any relationship, whereas the males of any species don't. They don't contribute very much at all, really, technically speaking. So you would think that the females of any species are the pickier ones, and the more attractive to the males the females of the species are, the pickier they can afford to be. That is to, to, to pick the most, the best prospects in, in the male the males in the vicinity, you know, which males are going to provide me with the most resources, which males have the best genetic um, potential. Uh, so they would be the ones who are picky, and the males would be the ones who are more interested in their image. And I think that plays out in the rest of the animal kingdom, in that it's always the males who are the ones that have the plumage, and the females are quite, you know, less spectacular looking. Uh, they're not the ones who are doing the dances. They're not the ones with the mesmerizing plumage. They're not the ones who are risking their lives to to get to get the resources. And they're not the ones who are fighting each other in order to uh, secure uh, the the handkerchief of the females. So I think it it's perhaps an odd and inverse um, um, event that has occurred in the human species where women are the ones who are more concerned about their image. It just strikes me as odd. <laughs> uh, but maybe maybe that makes perf perfect sense uh, in evolutionary terms. But I just think it, it's peculiar that it isn't the men who are the ones who are more concerned about their image but maybe that's not what the women are looking for so who knows but it's just an observation you know the, the peacock is the one with the plumage right the pea hen is is quite dull in comparison yes but we're talking about birds there um yes yeah yeah other animals basically <laughs> but uh I, humans I, are different yes and i think there are some polls or some one of those clickbait articles i was reading uh, about what women find unattractive in a man i think number one was vanity so um i think that says quite a lot uh, well it says a lot about polls it says something about polls but i think there might be some truth in fact in in dudes who are overly precious about how they look being a turnoff to normal women maybe that's because there's competition there competition competition from whom competition to look good Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, in the eyes You're of not interested in somebody who looks better than you. In, in the eyes of God, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think maybe that's an instinctive thing. Maybe women just instinctively find uh, men who are overly vain or egotistical or whatever as being unattractive because uh, women deep down um, want a rugged man. Well, who oozes masculinity. At the risk of veering into rape fantasy, I think uh, the makeup issue is quite interesting. I mean, just today, I saw two relatively young females walking down the road, and they looked like, to my eyes, and I apologize for this, but I swear to God, they looked like clowns. They had so much makeup on their faces. They looked ridiculous. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's generally an issue I have with an incredible amount of... Um, paint on uh on faces but this was outrageous and they were serious i mean they weren't actually dressed up as clowns but they had a clown like amount of makeup and this is when you had the rape fantasy no right this is when i was walking down the street and i just was struck by how bizarre it looked that <laughs> we had two humans who were made up facially uh as clowns i just i just looked and i just thought wow how weird is that it just struck me as really really odd i mean obviously i see this every day well i don't see that every day but i see makeup that is to say an application 
of I mean, it's cosmetics, it's wax, it's, I don't know what it's made out of precisely, but effectively paint on the faces of women. And I never, ever see paint on the faces of men. I'm sure I have seen paint on the faces of men in the flesh at one time or other, but I, I don't recall. Generally speaking, every day I see the paint on the women's faces. And I, I just, I think that that warrants closer inspection, I think, as a topic. I just, it seems odd to me. I just, I can't get over it. I have a note here. Um, there's a, um, a relatively famous blogger, feminist blogger called Emily Heist Moss. And one of her quotes was, to hell with all the truth covering face paint. I think there's a lot in that statement. Well, what that brings me on to is um, my suspicion that Radical feminists and people that um, tend to want to create trouble um, in situations where I'm sure there actually isn't any and just assert something that will make males feel uncomfortable, um, they might be less attractive <laughs> than women who tend not to, to behave that way. I think there is maybe some element of sour grapes involved where... Um, you mean, why, why am I not getting wolf whistles? Yeah, well, I don't mean... Well, maybe a little bit of that. And it's, it's some kind of reaction against that. Um, you know, which is fine, which is fair. It's, I think, from what I've seen, particularly in the industry I'm currently working in, is that women who um, are easy on the eye tend to um, be given a little more time um, just generally speaking, people want to speak to them. People want to um, uh, give them money. <laughs> give, people want to be seen with them. Yeah, people want to give them attention and all this kind of thing. And I think women who feel that they are just as intelligent, just as smart, and have so much to offer the world are unfairly sidelined because of aesthetic shortcomings. And uh, this is fuel for them to uh, for, for this crusade, yeah, which is understandable. I can understand that. I used to know a male model, and uh, he was a very attractive man. And, you know, as, as rough as he, he could have looked in the flesh, uh, when he's all made up and he's behind the camera, he looks, and the other side of the camera, he looks absolutely fably, fabulous. And you can see how he's photogenic, and, and everybody wanted to know him, men and women, because he was just so fabulous looking. You know, it's it's a massive factor. How you look is incredibly important, I think, especially if your goal is a relationship and um, you know to to try and to try and uh, couple yourself with who you perceive to be the best possible person to be coupled with. Uh, so I think looks and care and attention of your own appearance is incredibly important for everyone but it's a case of expectations and i've read lots of feminist postings about what men should look like and what they shouldn't look like in fact today in the times newspaper in the magazine there's a whole feature about 20 things men shouldn't look like uh and i think this is daily in the media you know constantly in the media it's all about what you look like what people think you should look like what people like what people don't like and there's a huge pressure on everyone um so where i'm going where i'm going with this is that is the pressure on women and the appearance larger that the general the general perceived pressure on women is it larger than the perceived pressure on men in terms of how they look and image and is this self um, generated as a, a gender i mean do women manufacture this pressure or is that pressure actively coming from the other gender and vice versa what do you think yeah i think um, there is that pressure and i think it's a bit of everything which creates this pressure um, and occasionally, if ever I'm feeling uh, empathetic, um, I will spare that person a thought. Um, you know, women are under quite a lot of pressure, I think, 
because um, this is a male-dominated world and you are you can be judged on how you look and all this kind of thing and i generally don't feel that pressure as a as a white male what accounts for this male domination well we've sort of covered yeah, this yeah i but think it's is a historical it... thing and plus also historical thing and um society based factors uh, in this but um i should just say as a, as a just brief aside on this i i chatted to um a former Playboy Playmate, Playmate of the Year from 2014, um, the other day, Friday, and I was speaking to this this human, and uh, she looked like an object. Meaning? <laughs> she didn't look real. She looked inorganic. Uh, you mean like implants and makeup and the rest? Just didn't look like a, I mean, she was very beautiful. Looked like a, looked like a doll. Yeah, she looked like a doll. And also, I actually, this is maybe a crazy irony, but I actually didn't want to speak to her anymore. It's like, I'm actually uncomfortable talking to you. Um, maybe it's the same kind of thing if, if you're uncomfortable speaking to a celebrity or something like that. Maybe it was something like that. But there was something really um, off-putting about this be beauty of hers and this almost Michael Jackson-like look that she had going on. Um, is it because you felt she was a victim? I think she, yeah, I, well, I don't know if that's what I thought. I think you could make an argument that she's a victim of something. I think for someone to spend all this money um, go putting herself through all these uh, surgical procedures to make her look a certain way, um, there is something about that, I think, which makes me feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, you know, I think... I, I, it would be a better if she was just to be more comfortable with her body and uh, learn to live with um, what she's seen as defects. Because, you know, I assumed, I asked her, you know, so are you a model? Assuming that that's what she does for a living. But she said, no, she works in finance or, or, or something like that. So, you know, it's not even like entirely necessary for her to be so beautiful to, uh, to, to make a living in the world. You know, she has other skills, other avenues to explore but yet puts herself through all of this. Anyway, that's just how I see it. She's Peculiar. Um, I, I mean, this is a, a bit of a tangent here, but um, a long time ago, I met somebody who had had a breast augmentation. Uh, and she had very large breasts and because she had implants. And this was at a, a house party. And I was talking to her. You know, she's very pretty and young and uh, and just had really big boobs. And I just asked her about them. And uh, she said, yeah, you know, I, I had a breast job. And I asked her, you know, why? Why did you do that? I mean, you know, what, what, what motivated you to get that done? And uh, she said, and I quote, I just didn't feel like a woman with what I had before. And now, now I feel more like a woman. You know, it, that, that was her reasoning for getting it done. And uh, that was a new one on me. There the are probably feminists who would hear that and think that that's a really sad situation that she, that she felt like that. Um, and I actually do think it's a sad situation. <laughs> I really don't like that kind of thing. And also I should say that you recounting that story, that does feel very um retrograde you're uh, you're speaking to a stranger and you ask her about her boobs <laughs> it was a house party oh that's okay you know, it was a house party it was you know you, you, you say what you want uh, it was fine at the time and she was completely cool and everything was fine it was fine um i i just wanted to know and uh she explained to me um very cogently and i thought oh you know that, that's a that, that's a reasonable reason. A anything goes at a house party. Can I go and uh, kill a bunch of people? But anyway, I wouldn't quite go that far, but uh, I certainly felt like doing that a few times. But uh, moving on to um, accountability. So again, we're talking about feminism, and it's it, I find it really hard to pin this down uh, as an actual subject. But uh, I, I'm I'm simply going by what I have absorbed from the media in particular and I, I sort of have a feeling that 
the media is the problem. They are the problem. They want conflict. They want sensationalism, and they want um, feminists to have a, an agenda, it would seem. Because every article I read, I just it, it seems so combative. And yet, when I read into the article, there's there's very little substance, and I, I'm you know I'm just it just it sounds angry. I read the entire article, and I'm left thinking I don't even know what that was about. It was I, I just don't get it. I have to read it a few times to try and get any meaning from it whatsoever. And I, this happens again and again and again. Have you heard of someone called Anita Sarkeesian? Yes. You know, she's a YouTuber. Yeah. Do you know about her her cause? Well, I mean, I'll just explain for the listeners. She is someone who feels that this culture of misogyny um, comes from video, video games. games. Yeah, and um, she started a, a she had this Kickstarter campaign um, where she her her pitch was I'm going to um, create a series of videos to uh, to raise some awareness about how harmful these video games are, um, and she got I think. At the last count, it was like half a million dollars or something to make these games. And when part of her pitch was that she's going to do all this amazing research um, to, to prove um, her, her belief that uh, video games are so, so toxic and so bad for society. Um, and um, she, n nothing of what she's done is based on any actual evidence. It's entirely... Uh, made up. It's just stuff that she just made up, and um, this is the content that, that she's putting out. And there's this few Rory online about how she's um, just making stuff up about video games, um, just creating creating problems where um, there really isn't. And this is what I said very early on about how people who are sort of picking her up on her her lies are just being absolutely just trashed right into the ground um, to the point where I I'm, I'm imagine decent people just wouldn't even want to go there or they wouldn't want to just get involved because seeing to take an interest uh, in the other direction would be somehow uh, putting yourself in a line of fire and they will just sort of like tacitly just sort of agree with her premise yep 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 it's got to be right video games where you're raping women yeah yeah that's they happen, and that's bound to be uh, bad news for society. Yep, you have my full support. And th and this is incredibly familiar. Where have we heard this before? This has happened again and again and again. Of course the world is flat. Of course it is. You know, you, the creationists and the religionists, this is always there, you know, I'm just going to shout you down and I'm just right and you just have to believe and forget about the evidence. This is that kind of argument. It's no, completely vapid. It is and it isn't. I mean, if you're... Um, well, the reason why I say it isn't is because there are consequences to be paid if you challenge any of this, whereas I'm sure there are other things where you could have a healthy sort of discussion. Um, and yeah, challenge. reason. Yeah, reasons. reason takes a back seat. So it seems to me it's all emotional and it's based on nonsense. So I mean, you, you wrote here in the show notes about um, about a backlash, and I think were if a backlash were to happen, it would be because of situations like this. And actually, well, you know, I mean, it just popped into my head as well just then. This is another situation quite similar to this. In fact, this is pretty relevant. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about this uh, in your country. But in Rolling Stone magazine, there was this article called A Rape on Campus. Does this ring any bells? Yes. It won the worst journalism of 2014 award or whatever. And it was this yeah. really unbelievably badly sourced story of um, this rape that happened in some college in somewhere in Virginia, I think. Um, and it was, it was just made up. It was just made up. And uh, the, the author of the story just... She wanted a story about a rape, and then so she just so she could write about the, the problem with uh, patriarchy and uh, misogyny and all these kinds of things. And so she found someone to say, "Oh yeah, I've been raped," and then didn't source the story at all. It just just wrote it and trashed a bunch of people. There's a huge fallout. Um, you know, a, a real uh, you know feminists right across the country were all uniting about this problem, and. It was completely, didn't exist. 
Um, and so I see that as, as putting the feminist agenda, you know, taking it back a few steps. It's like all the, the, the noble aims uh, that they have in, in, in the broadest sense. This is clearly harmful. And so I put her in the same boat as the Anita Sarkeesian affair. Yes. It reminds me of cake in uh, Brass Eye. It, it doesn't even exist, and yet there's an uproar. Um, I, I did a little bit of research the other day, and I read a quotation about rape. Rape is a real problem, I think, for everyone. It's it's a terrible, horrible, awful thing, and it, it but it's it, it's it's difficult and a problem for feminism on many fronts, not least of which the reportage. I read a quotation, and here it is. Approximately 85,000 women and 12,000 men are raped in England and Wales alone every year. That's roughly 11 rapes of adults alone every hour. That's a quotation on a website called rapecrisis.org.uk, right? The first hit if you search for rape in the UK. So you read this statement and it sounds really awful. I mean, really terribly, incredibly awful. Like we have a major, major epidemic of rape in this country. And it, it cites a report entitled An Overview of Sexual Offending in England and Wales. So I clicked on that link and uh, had a look at the report. And the report is from the Office for National Statistics which is a very sober, serious, and, um, you know, very um, well-qualified organization when it comes to um, national assays on any particular topic. So I opened up the report, and in the report it states, it is estimated that 0.5% of females report being a victim of the most serious offenses of rape or sexual assault by penetration in the previous 12 months, equivalent to around 85,000 victims on average per year. Among males, less than 0.1%, around 12,000, report being a victim of the same types of offenses in the previous 12 months. There's a massive difference between those two statements. I mean, an incredible, massive, huge gaping chasm of logical difference between those two statements that should be made clear on this rapecrisis.org.uk website. I, I run into this all the time, these statistics that are meaningless and just horrifically distorted. Um, and another example I found uh, in the, the, the Independent, which is a uh, uh, a well-regarded newspaper in the UK. And it spoke of the International Women's Day in 2014. And the quotation was, globally, about one in three women will be beaten or raped during their lifetime. So, you know, that was the title of the article. Really, just incredible. Just, wow, you know, real problem. Um, so again, the citation. Um, well, before the citation, there is another uh, quotation. The violence epidemic. Half of women in Britain admit they have been physically or sexually assaulted according to a shocking new figures. And this linked to the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, and it was a report entitled Violence Against Women, an EU-wide survey. So I opened up this report, which is freely available, and it's in the show notes, and it states it is based on interviews with 42,000 women across the EU, right, 42,000 women, so obviously there are a couple of hundred million women in the EU who were asked about their experiences of physical, sexual, and psychological violence, including incidents of intimate partner violence, uh, domestic violence. These are outrageous estimates. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think that last one is, is that unreasonable. It's unreasonable because, for starters, when you ask somebody, did X, Y, and Z happen mm -hmm. right you're asking them these this is all anecdotal you know first of all who are you asking how are you selecting for the survey how random is the survey where is the survey happening who is asking the survey what are the questions who are the people how many of them are there 
What are the cultural differences? What is the spectrum? There's so much to take into consideration. Is it being trimmed? Is it a, you know, what, what is the standard deviation? There's so much you need to know that could potentially convince you that it's worthwhile that's being left out in all of these reports. I mean, I've never you know, once I, I, seen I don't agree with that. any journalist, journalistic reportage that explains the parameters of the surveys. I, I, just, I just think it sounds better if you have bigger numbers and it's more frightening. It, it sounds better if you have a cause and if you have an agenda. And I, I see this as a problem. Well, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I see what you're saying, um, but, you know, it is, you know, news items tend to want to be sensational just by their very nature. But as I say, I mean, I, um, canvassing 42,000 women across the EU, I don't think is, um, uh, I don't think is a useless thing. I think that there is some value in, in, in that data there. Um, I'm not at all saying there's no value. Oh, no, no, but I, but I, I, I disagree with, with your um, asserting that that's like inflated to the point where it becomes um, just fear-mongering and, and untrue. I'm not the person making the assertions. The articles in the newspapers are yes. making the assertions. That's what I'm trying to point out. They are saying, quote, approximately 85,000 women and 12,000 men are oh, raped that's different. in okay, okay, Wales no, no, I mean, every year. And where they got that yeah. from is... <laughs> I, t- I take exception... To, okay, yeah, I take exception to that one. Um, but the second one, I mean, you know, how, how, how do you get data here? You know, what do you do? I mean, it's a difficult thing. No, indeed. But, but what you don't do is you have statements that say, and I quote, the violence epidemic... Half of women in Britain admit they have been physically or sexually assaulted according to a shocking new figures. That's not helpful, yeah. especially when you look at the actual evidence. And the evidence is, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a, there are wide, massive parameters That is a there, wild extrapolation that is just f- for the purpose of sensationalizing um, that article. And, and, and it doesn't stop there. I mean, honestly, honestly, every time... I read these articles, these feminist articles. I, I'm shocked by the lack of um, uh, fevered um, reliance on on you know exceptional evidence. Another example is, and I was reading lack this, of. this this la- yeah la- lack of lack of um, veracity. Yes. This morning I was reading an article in the Guardian. This morning, and it was entitled 10 Ways You Can Tell If You're a Feminazi." Right. Where, where was Laura this? Bates in the Guardian this morning, okay. the Guardian newspaper, and ten. So ten ways you can tell if you're a feminazi. Number four, you think it's pretty unfair that women effectively work from the fourth of November until the end of the year for free because of the gender pay gap, and the female managers work for free for nearly two hours a day, and that the pay gap and this is a hyperlink, is even wider for women of color and disabled women, right? That pay gap hyperlink was broken. It didn't go anywhere on The Guardian. The first comment to that article was, and I quote, you think it's pretty unfair that women effectively work from 4th of November until the end of the year for free because of the gender pay gap, and that female managers work for free for nearly two hours a day. I wonder how many times this needs to be disproved before it sinks in. Now, the author of that article, Laura Bates, presumably was interested in the comments that were accumulating at the bottom of her article for The Guardian. You may be forgiven for thinking that it would be incumbent upon her to fix the broken link to the key bit of information that evidenced her findings. No. So in the morning, I looked at that article. In the evening, I looked at that article. That link is still broken. Where is, where, where is the evidence that there's this massive pay gap? There isn't a pay gap. All the, all the research I've done, I, 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 where is that pay gap? Where is it? We would be outraged if we learned that a man and a woman going for a job the same job and the woman gets paid less that it just where does that happen? i think that is a fact by the way 
I, I, I dispute I, I, that. I was working on some infographics. I would have to see the evidence. Would you be convinced by the evidence, though? Absolutely. Okay. I, 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 this is, I, I'm, I only operate on the okay. evidence because... Well, hey, well, okay. the, the, I, for instance, I mean, the reasoning behind this, this pay gap issue seems to me it's women work fewer hours. This is a fact, right? They do take a year off to have a baby. <laughs> they, they, they're much more... There are many more women working in part-time positions relatively speaking, than men. There just are. And when they generate these statistics, they're, they're taking that into consideration in, in a bad way. So they're, they're taking the number of women employed and the number of men employed, and they're seemingly just adding up all of the salaries and the same jobs. And they say, well, look, men are getting paid more than women. Yeah, that's because women are working fewer hours and they're working more part-time jobs. Uh, okay, a couple of things there. The, the first one is, yes, it's it's profoundly dishonest for so-called journalists to um, knowingly distort and mislead. Um, and them not fixing that link suggests that that person would know that um, her information is bogus, but she doesn't want to let the truth get in the way of, you know, point number four. The other thing is, is I actually don't doubt that there is a pay gap of sorts. Um, just in my own anecdotal experience. And I guess it's different from industry to industry, but just last week I was working on some infographic. Uh, I work in Hollywood, and it was an infographic for the highest earners in Hollywood. And these include actors, you know, big, big A-list actors. And they were all women. Oh, no, no, all, all guys. And then... Got... <laughs> Important distinction. Yeah, they, they were all guys at the top. And then I think apart from Katy Perry was in there. Katy Perry was was you know 130 million right behind all these other uh, dudes. And then towards the bottom, then you, you then women started creeping into it. So it, at, it, in this industry, I, I think it might be true that there is some disparity in uh, in, in wages. There there obvi there obviously is a disparity, but it's a case of what accounts for that disparity right. is it gender or is it capability well i mean you've got george clooney who commands this much for a film and you compare that to i don't know who's an equally prolific female actress julia roberts julia roberts yeah yeah and i don't think any differences between um their pay packet i don't think it would be anything to do with how julia roberts takes time off to have a baby for example um you know, I, I could it be market mechanisms and supply and demand? You know, in Hollywood, maybe you command more money because you're more popular. Well, because well, maybe more bums but on seats. Perhaps. What, but I just don't think it's a coincidence that it tends to be guys who are the high earners. But what accounts for it? Um, just patriarchy, <laughs> misogyny, uh, historical um, inequality. How, how does that manifest? in uh guys getting more money than women yeah but i mean how i mean how how <laughs> why does it happen do you actually think there are people sitting there thinking you know well you're a woman so obviously i'll pay you less i think maybe it does but maybe they just don't even realize it i think there just is um is this difference i mean i'm not i, I mean i wouldn't doubt okay i've actually come to this um with the um with the uh, preconceived notion that women do get paid less. Um, and then yeah. I would then see if I was proven otherwise by evidence of Google searches and, and all the rest of it. Indeed, absolutely. Yes. Whereas I, I've come to this thinking, first of all, I, I just simply don't understand what feminism is. And I understand what gender equality is. And I understand you know, I, I vaguely understand, but importantly, vaguely understand the physiological differences between men and women. And I understand sexism a little bit. Uh, but I'm not going to automatically assume facts uh, without evidence. Um, and there is a backlash. I mean, all of this faulty reasoning and blame and lack of evidence. There are lots of women out there who just cringe when they hear feminists speak 
and, and there has there is actually a movement against this this nonsense um you know there are women against uh, feminism basically and it all it all sprouts from personal responsibility so chrissy hind she's sort of a famous uh, feminist icon um she was in the pretenders right chrissy hind was in the pretenders and she wrote a memoir called reckless and uh, she was sexually assaulted uh, when she was 21 and and she says and i quote you can't paint yourself into a corner and then say whose brush is this you have to take responsibility i mean i was naive she followed up these remarks by saying that the women who dress provocatively in public are to blame for their own attacks, culminating with, you know, if you don't want to entice a rapist, don't wear high heels so you can't run from him. And this is from an article by Rhiannon Lucy Coslett, again in The, the Guardian. Um, I have read several newspapers looking for feminist articles, and I did find a few, but the most pertinent ones to this uh, conversation were in The Guardian, coincidentally. And this is just the other day. This is August the 31st, this article. Um, Hind underwent a traumatic sexual assault when she had barely reached adulthood. How sad that she has blamed herself for it for more than 40 years when the responsibility lies, as it does in all cases, with her attackers. So, I mean, I, this rubbed me the wrong way because... Rape is a terrible thing, and you know you should never be raped, right? Just like you should never be murdered. Uh, it's really not fair. But also, accountability has to come into it. It just has to come into it. I mean, who is accountable for your safety? Should it be 100% other people? Or should you take accountability for your own safety? And I think the backlash against feminism by women is a lot about the perceived infantilization of women um, through this movement. It's like, it's victimhood. F you know, women are victims, and we need to, to group together to try and protect ourselves from the evil men. Not, you know, exonerating themselves of any responsibility for their own personal safety. So I think there's a lot in that. I think feminism, from a lot of the articles that I've read, like this one, do infantilize women and i think that absolutely is not the right route to take in terms of equality and you know uh, uh, an equality of of consideration it just seems very peculiar to me so I, I can see the backlash against feminism and i can see feminism gone too far and i can see feminist fallacies and i can certainly see the disengagement from reality in terms of evidence and i think all of that is very harmful but I still want to keep into keep in view general equality. I mean, discrimination is not fair. It's not fair, certainly, if an employer looks at a couple of candidates of different genders and thinks, you know what, they're equally able, but the woman might get pregnant, and you know we will have to try and cover her role for a significant amount of time, and she may come back different. You know, she was all fired up and really dedicated. Uh, but after having a child, you know, her priorities may shift to the point where she's less valuable to us. Therefore, we're going to hire the man, right? That's not that's not fair, but I, I believe that happens. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that happens. Going back to the Chrissy Hind thing, I'm all pretty uneasy about, um, about the whole rape argument because rape really is such... Uh, a horrible thing. I mean, it's it's the worst thing, actually, I think, that, that can happen. And so um, I agree with you that we need to take some responsibility. And the fact is, we live in a world with rapists. Um, but... Who, who are who are vastly... What? More often men. Yeah, I don't think a woman would rape a woman. Um, but um, I feel like I just can't get involved in that argument just being a dude because it's just me being a man saying hey look look love don't don't put those high heels on otherwise you know what'll happen because it, it almost sounds like a kind of um almost like islamic kind of uh headspace to be in you know wear a veil you know you don't want to tempt men you know yeah but you would say 
look, be careful with that road because it's really fast. There's a yes. lot of blind points. Yeah, well, no, no, you know, it, it, be careful, don't get killed. Uh, don't walk down that alleyway because there are murderers. No, no, down I, there. I, I understand. Don't stop, walk across stop. that field because it has landmines in it. Yeah, no, I, I. But I'm just saying that it's just a fact that we live in a world with rapists. So um, yeah, you need to be uh, a little bit more careful about um, how you how you dress. So, I mean, even just saying that it just sounds terrible. You know, who the hell am I to to say something so shocking? Like, you know, teach them not to rape. I, you know, I believe in that, but it's just a fact that there are bad people in the world. There are. Unfortunately, it's a fact. So you have to take personal responsibility. Not only do you need to, you know, try and um, proselyte, proselytize people who are in danger, you also want to take personal responsibility in that it would be really dumb to walk in this particular area at this particular time. I mean, that's in no way justifying or authorizing uh, transgressors of horrible violent crimes um but it but it is saying look you know be reasonable it's like people i mean i'm a cyclist and occasionally i will see pedestrians who just walk along the sidewalk and then jerk right and walk immediately across the zebra crossing, thinking that all traffic are going to screech to a halt and they're invulnerable because they're on a zebra crossing. No, you're going to get killed if you do that. You need to stop, you need to consider the traffic, and you need to make you know reasonable judgments in order to maneuver your body across the road. Just because there are laws in place or there are rules in place doesn't mean you are then immune of any ills directed towards your body you know don't assume protection don't think you're encapsulated because you're following the rules um take personal accountability and um be reasonable everybody needs to be reasonable that's all i'm saying have we covered everything i think we have this has been like a bumper edition we're now what is it one hour almost one hour it's 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 a tough a tough subject and honestly i i still don't fully understand what's going on uh but i think i think it's important fairness is important fairness is important no, but i do understand why consideration you have a problem of understanding feelings. what feminism is I, I we just, just, we just done a whole show about it <laughs> we have i'll have to listen to it and then i'll know yeah uh, but, but uh, hey, hey, there's. Uh, go, so, so what is this? I, let, let's just summarize this thing. So you say I don't know what fem feminism is. You've said that several times. So what, what do you yes, mean? because every time I hear anything along feminist lines, I hear in my mind sexism and gender equality, okay. which to me are two different subjects. Well, maybe so. Does fem is feminism just a you know a a, a, a bag in which those two topics? Uh, uh, live sure. well, why or, not? or is feminist but, uh, something else i mean to me feminism really means sisterhood and and i really i hesitate to say but i can imagine a lot of people think feminism means a militant misandry no, no, hang on so i mean i think that sound, that sounds like it covers it i think there is gender equality uh sexism sisterhood i think that's what fem feminism is i think that's what feminism is I guess, I guess, I guess so. So, are you still going to turn around and say, "I just don't know what feminism is"? <laughs> no, I guess I, I, I think my issue there, and the reason why I say I don't know what feminism is, I think it's a, it's tautologically unnecessary. Right. I think why don't we just talk about sexism and gender? No, equality? because well, what is no, this feminism? Because feminism, feminism is the sisterhood, me means the victimhood. Feminism, part yeah, of it. feminism to me means pro women and and you know against everyone else, and that everyone else being men. You know, it it infers that. You know, this is an argument against men, which I think is not necessarily always the case because feminism could mean, look, girls, we need to focus on this, this and this to, you know, increase our value in X, Y and Z. You know, it may not even involve men at all. It just may just mean, you know, let's get together and be better or understand ourselves better. Or, you know. in, in order to say, I'm going to sound pretty, pretty crappy now, but I think feminism, I mean, I agree with the aims of um uh, like like traditional feminism, which we spoke about earlier, you know, um, the right to vote, you know, e equality, basically. But um, it seems like fem feminism is this um, wanting to be as kind of awkward and difficult 
um, and take the innocuous uh, to an extreme. You know, it's like anything that seems innocuous is suddenly not. And anything which might say something that is the most anodyne thing imaginable, but somehow that could be twisted into being somehow offensive to, to women. Um, and I was working with this uh, woman who I guess she was feminist, I suppose. But she would say things to me that I guess was like pretty offensive. It's, um, I think it just popped into my head. It was like, you know, I've, I've got, I've had pretty bad skin in my life. And I had a big pus filled spot. And she sat down next to me and I was like, oh man, this spot is driving me nuts. <laughs> and she was like, oh, that's so gross. That is so male. Did she really she said that? that? She goes, that is so male. Now, can you imagine, now, what would happen if the other way around? Speaking about your, your personal human functions. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, all, there's all this weird double standards thing. There was something that was in the news. I think it's actually in England, but it made the news here for some reason. And there was this, like a pub or something, where the staff, the male staff, wore kilts. And there was this hen, hen do. Um, you, you know what a what a hen a hen party is like. What are they called? Hen Hindus. Hindu. Hindu yeah. um, and the guy said that these the the women in Hindu were like you know reaching under this guy's kilt and grabbing his junk and all this kind of stuff. And it had to put a sign up to say you know please don't don't do this to the staff. And it's just absolutely unthinkable the other way around. I mean, could you imagine the other way around? <laughs> There, there would be World War Three. I, I think. think something. Um, I think prison sentences would probably happen. If yeah, it was the other yeah. Way around. I agree. Um, you mentioned uh, the the suffrage, the the female votes, and equality generally speaking. And one thing that has sort of always bugged me is that that vote uh, in this country in 1922 to give women the uh, the vote um, in the democratic system. In Viet the Vietnam War in the United States, I don't think women were drafted. I don't think so. I could be wrong here. And yet they have the vote. So if you have the vote and you can send people to war, but the people you're sending really are by and large men, and you're immune from a military draft, and yet you still have the vote, I, I don't find I, I fail to see how that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a weird quandary. So the suffragettes in this country who chained themselves to the railings. Um, they were arguing for a vote, and yet they were very much against the draft, and and they were you know they were immune to being drafted. Hmm. And yet they won the vote. So that's something to think about. Also, uh, in the glossary here in the notes, we have this phenomenon of man spreading. I don't know if you know about this one, but I certainly do. This is the practice of sitting in public transport with legs wide apart, thereby covering more than one seat. Now, I don't know about covering more than one seat, but I have always had a problem sitting on a chair and my legs not just splaying apart. And I think it's a physiological thing. I think men have slimmer pelvises and our legs are not angled inward as much as women and they just tend to splay when, when seated, especially if you're slouching. Your legs just splay apart. It, this, and it, it's actually, it takes energy to, to push them together to the point where I thought Velcro might be in order. But uh, <laughs> I have always had this problem. And I think it's a physiological thing. So I think man spreading uh, and um, chastising men for this, this behavior, I think is a little unfair on physiological grounds. I have certainly seen man spreading um, when I used to use a London the London Underground. If anyone's not familiar with what the London Underground is, it's a network of tubes underneath London with trains shuffle about at speeds, literally almost twice the speed of walking. Um, yeah, it's uh, and I, I have seen that. And I think I got annoyed by guys who take that to an extreme. Because I, I, I agree with you. I think it is like a natural thing. But I think there are guys who maybe somehow it's uh, it's some exerting their their masculinity that somehow want to splay their legs meaning that i have to be rubbing up against his leg um but i think to a large part it's a, it's just the way our bodies are designed as men i just think you know that's, that's the way in which your legs uh, find themselves uh, another little uh, uh glossary item here is rape culture now we haven't said very much 
of anything about the rest of the world in terms of feminism. But uh, rape culture, the definition here is a setting in which rape is pervasive and normalized due to societal attitudes about gender and sexuality. Now, certainly there are a lot of countries, nations, and ideologies that are, could certainly, from, from our point of view, be identified as a, a rape culture. But I think that absolutely and in no way is applicable to the West at large, I think. That to say that, and if any feminist says there's a rape culture in this country, that is offensive and outrageous. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. Um, I can see where they're coming from when they're talking about um, situations where alcohol is involved. You know, I mean, you, you know what alcohol does. And I think there are, they're talking about specific situations where a woman has had so much alcohol that she just is not um, of sound mind. Compass mentis. Yeah, she's not compass mentis. And I see they think, so, so they see having sex with a drunk woman, that is rape. And then so by, um, and, and by that parameter, then suddenly, yeah, I guess there probably is, you know, pervasive rape culture in the West. I'm sure that happens all the time. Yeah, so if, if, and, and you know, you, you could, that, that would play out as if a woman has had any alcohol at all, then you're taking advantage and you're on dodgy ground. So, you know, and, and again, that, but again, that's victimhood and infantilization. If you start going down that route, you say, okay, look, woman, you've had a sip of wine. Therefore, you're not yourself. You're not making your right judgments. You don't know what to think. And, you know, you need to be locked up in a, in a crash until you sober up. I, I do hear certain arguments that are not far from that. And I think that really is just man hating. I, I, I think it's, it, it definitely happens. Anyway, um, you have been listening to Eclecticist. We have a supporting webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. Please visit. You can see information on upcoming shows. You can see all of our previous podcasts and the notes that we publish. Our next show is going to be about NDEs or near-death experiences. Our outro music of choice this week is, uh, again, something open source. Uh, it's out of copyright. Uh, hopefully we won't get sued. This is a piece by the pianist and composer Clara Wieck Schumann. Uh, she wrote her first concerto at 14. She married Robert Schumann when she was 21 and with whom she composed and performed. Clara, she stopped composing at 36. And the quotation is, I once believed that I possessed creative talent, but I have given up this idea. A woman must not desire to compose. There has never yet been one able to do it. Should I expect to be the one? Sounds insane now, but uh, <laughs> but at the time, uh, perhaps it was more fitting to the, the culture. Who knows? But it's the Scherzo number no. 2, um, Opus 14, performed by Louise Saro. And uh, this is from museopen.org. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>